Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles out. Go with me to uh, my favorite book in all of the New Testament. I have two books that, that wrestle for my attention all the time. One is the book of Romans, and the other is the book of Hebrews. I love those books uh, tremendously. I believe that the same man who wrote Romans is also the same man who penned Hebrews. There are some differences theologically uh, in some circles about who the author of Hebrews is, but I believe it is uh, the Apostle Paul. And by the way, in the early church, that was the tradition up until uh, the third or fourth century. And, and then the other people started coming into play. So tonight, we're going to go into the book of Romans, so you're going to need that. Uh, I started something Sunday that was kind of messy. I started talking about captive Christianity. How many of you got ministered to out of that message, right? And we'll continue this this coming Sunday morning. The Lord's already been speaking to me about this Sunday and what we're going to share. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to take a moment and I want to remind you of some things that I taught you Sunday so that I can build the stage uh, to, to build upon that tonight, okay, as we, uh, as we talk about captive Christianity. And the theme of our series here, or the theme that I'm trying to communicate, is that uh, when we got saved, uh, our, our, our spirit man became born again. But there's two-thirds of us that's still wrestling with this thing called salvation, right? So uh, I want to remind you of some things that I shared with you. First of all, I, I taught you that there are basically three views of this doctrine called sanctification. And again, I, I just want to stress to you, doctrine matters. Say that out loud with me, please. Doctrine matters. And here's the reason why. Because what you believe determines what you do. Right? Being flows out of believing. And so it's very important that we have the right kind of doctrine. When we get into erroneous areas, that's when our life gets off track. So I taught you about this doctrine called sanctification and how there's circles that view it differently. And so basically it's summed up in the three categories. Number one is ultimate sanctification. Ultimate sanctif sanctification is the glorification of the believer. And we know that this happens after death or the resurrection when God sets his people apart from sins, presence, and possibility forever. In other words, when we meet Jesus, the Bible says we shall be like him. Old things will pass away truly in every sense of the word. This corruption will put on incorruption. This mortal will put on immortality. That When we talk about ultimate sanctification, that's what we're talking about. Then I taught you that there is something that is taught in theological circles called progressive sanctification. And basically that is the ongoing, incomplete, lifelong maturing process in which a Christian gradually becomes more and more holy or more and more like Jesus Christ every single day. And this is how we should be living our life. Uh, if, if you... Uh, were saved 10 years ago and you're still battling some of the same issues that you had 10 years ago, you really, I really question whether or not you truly met Jesus. Because when you met Jesus, there should have been a l literal landscape shift in your life. Even those of you who did, I'm talking about you were radically in the world. When you came to Christ, something inside you should have changed. And, and as the old song says, I've got something on the inside, working on the outside. And oh, what a change has come in my life. So every day we're supposed to be, as the Bible says, conformed. Everybody say conformed. Into His image, right? And if the Lord tarries long enough... Every day, somebody's around you. And, and I'm going to tell you the number one judge of this. The number one judge of this is your family. Not strangers. You can put on a good show for, your stra for strangers. But if your family says you're not looking more and more like Jesus, you need to work on the progressive sanctification side. Now, don't tell Pam that I just taught that, okay? I'll tell her if I want her to know. And then there's something called instantaneous or positional sanctification. 
And what this is, is a doctrine that says that when you get saved, sanctification occurs at the moment of belief and involves the believer being set apart from the world to follow Christ. This is taught, it's specifically Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy circles. And again, I went to Lee University and I love my alma mater. And that was what was taught in the Church of God circles. And so it created these, these different doctrines or divisions of sanctification created in me a great wrestle. And the reason I say it created me a great wrestle is because this thing about instantaneous positional sanctification, I disproved it all by myself. I didn't need anybody's help. I'd come down to the altar, like many of you, I'd repent of a sin on Sunday morning. And before I got to the parking lot, I was already thinking or doing the same thing that I asked the Lord to forgive me of. So I thought, man, I have lost my mind. And so as a result, guess what I did? I'm in Bible college studying to be a preacher, getting saved every single Sunday. Just keep looking straight forward. Nobody will know I'm talking about your, the way you're doing your life. I was getting you saved every single Sunday until I learned something wonderful that I actually believed in all three of these doctrines. That when I came to Jesus, I have been saved positionally. When I came to Christ, my spirit man was born again and was justified, just as if I never sinned, positionally made right with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am being saved in the progressive sense that I have not reached this ultimate sanctification or glorification yet. And I'm trying to become more and more like Christ. And one day I will be saved. I will receive my glorified body. So the truth of the matter is, is we should believe in all three of these. Now, the, the doctrine that set me on the right path concerning my walk with God. In fact, this is the number one single most important doctrine that revolutionized my entire life as a believer is this doctrine called the Trinity. Now, I know uh, by Facebook comments from my last message that there are people that are Sabellian in, in nature, in, in belief systems. Sabellian means they, they believe it, they're the oneness doctrine, that, that there's only one God. And basically that God manifests himself in the Old Testament as Father. He manifests himself in the New Testament as Son. And then he manifests himself in our current period as the Holy Spirit. But we don't believe in one God with three personalities. We don't believe in one God with just three manifestations of himself. We believe in one God, three persons, who manifest himself in three distinct eternal uh, persons that are divine, each one of them divine. God the Father is God. God the Son is all God. And God the Holy Ghost is all God. Yet the three even though they're individual, they are one. Now, again, we have to, at some point, just to accept some things by faith that our little finite peanut brains cannot wrap themselves around. And the doctrine of the Trinity is one of them. When I get to thinking about he's three yet one, it just blows my mind. But because I'm a hillbilly, Come on, somebody. And because I'm country and because i gotta, I got to wrestle with things and I've got to get kind of a, a grasp or an understanding, the Lord wants us to understand these things. He wants us to grapple with these things. He wants us to know the essence of who He is. So what I had to do is I had to kind of frame uh, God in a way of relating to me in three dimensions of relationship. So I see Jesus as my Savior. I see God as my Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit as my Comforter. Now that doesn't mean that I don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm just telling you how I'm trying to uh, comprehend how God is working in and through me, okay? I, ho I hope I'm... I've asked the Lord, help me communicate this. And this is the reason the Catholics came out with this old doctrine called the doctrine of incomprehensibility. Because there's some things that you just can't comprehend. And, and the Trinity is just one of those. And sometimes when I get Sabellians together, the Jesus-only people, and I put them in the same room, and one of, the, one of my dearest friends in all of the world 
was Dr. T.F. Tenney. T.F. Tenney was the, the general superintendent uh, of the United Pentecostal Church. And, and I would go preach conferences. And Dr. Tenney, she's been with me. Dr. Tenney would be there. And he would preach one night and I'd preach one night or vice versa. And Dr. Tenney behind closed doors would say, Shane, you need to become United Pentecostal. You're not assemblies of God at all. You're oneness. I said, no, Dr. Tenney, I'm not oneness, I'm Trinitarian. He said, well, you don't preach like a Trinitarian. I said, that's because I believe you and I believe basically the same thing. We're just wrestling, trying to explain an eternal God that's beyond our comprehension. And, and, and I really do believe that. I do believe that. Uh, but just because I'm a Trinitarian, I have to figure out how to comprehend this. So I see Jesus as my Savior. These are dimensions of relationship. God as my Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit as my Comforter. And, and I gave you an earthly example to get your mind around this. And, and I'm going into where I'm going to teach tonight. But let me just do this. My grandkids see me as Pop. I'm Pop to my grandbabies, right? My children, <laughs> yeah, y'all say, I know you see it. The coolest guy who ever lived and has all the money, right? Uh, my, my child, Adam, sees me as father. He relates to me as father, right? My, my, grand, my son says to me all the time, Dad, why, don't you, why didn't you treat me like you treat the grandbabies? And I said, that's because there's something blessed about grandbabies that sets them apart from you. And he said, what is that? I said, it's called tail lights. When I get tired of them, I can put them in your car and send them home with you. <laughs> right? No, it, the truth is, it's just dimensions of relationship. Right? doesn't mean I don't love them any one more than the other. It's just dimensions of how we relate. And then my wife sees me as stud muffin or husband. And, you know, she thinks I'm hot. And that's great. You might think I'm terribly ugly. It doesn't matter. As long as she's deceived, I'm in. Praise the Lord. And then my church relates to me as pastor. You relate to me as pastor. But I'm just one person. Come on, everybody hold up one finger. I'm just one person. But out of my one being, my one essence, my one person flows many different relationships, right? Now, why is that important? Because you're created in the image and in the likeness of God, which means you also are a Trinitarian being in that, number one, you are a spirit being. That's who you really are. The real you is on the inside. It's not on the outside. That's the reason the Bible says not to judge by the outward appearance as men do. Because the real you is not what you see. Come on. You look much better than what you look in the mirror. All right. I'm going to try that again. My spirit man, y'all can't see it, but I asked the Lord one time, I said, would you let me see what my spirit man looks like? It looked like a cross between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno. I had abs and I had biceps and triceps. I was, no, nah, he didn't really show me that, but that's how I see my spirit man. But how many know on the outside, I don't have that, right? So, I am a spirit being, but I live in a body. And this body is just as real as my spirit being. And then I have a soul, which was, is the seed of my intellect, the mind, the will, and emotions, okay? And it's really important for you to understand that you're created in the image and the likeness of God because if you don't comprehend that, then you'll never, ever figure out how to walk in freedom as a Christian. If you don't comprehend that. And if you don't comprehend how you as a Trinitarian being relationally have dimensions of relationship that you've got to get control of, you'll never have victory as a Christian. You'll walk in defeat the rest of your life. So my body gives me world consciousness. It's what makes me aware of all the surroundings. It does that through the five senses. My spirit man gives me God consciousness. Now... You're, you're not God conscious till you're born again. Your spirit man is dead to, unto God in, in, in that it can't relate to God because it's not been born again. It's corrupted. When Adam fell, 
Nothing changed with his body other than it began to die physically. But when Adam ate of the apple, he didn't, or whatever fruit it was, I believe it was a fig, whenever Adam ate of that fruit in disobedience, immediately something shifted in his life. But it wasn't on the outside, it was on the inside. What happened? His spirit man died. Romans chapter 5 tells us, tells us this. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. And Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone. Now as a result of Adam's sin, all of you guys and myself are born with a fallen nature. Now I believe that we were born innocent. I don't believe a baby, look at me, I'm going to make a theological statement that you're, you're going to have to wrestle with. I'm not asking you to believe me, I'm asking you to do what I did, wrestle with it until the Holy Ghost gives you clarity. I don't believe that a baby is born a sinner. Because if he is born a sinner and he dies at one month old, he goes to hell. But I believe that a child is born innocent with a sin nature. In other words, his bent is towards sin. See, some of y'all just had a problem with that because all your life you've been taught that you were born a sinner. No, I believe you were born innocent, but you were born with a sin nature. Because if you're born a sinner and you're not come to the age of awareness and you die, you die in your sin, which means you die eternally separated from God. I don't believe that a child who dies in the mother's womb or post the mother's womb after a short period of time dies and goes to hell. I believe that they're born innocent and they'll be judged on that innocence. But it does not take long for a child to figure out how to lie and how to sin, right? And the older they get, the better they get at it, right? Why is that? It's because when Adam sinned, that disease, and this is really important for where we're going tonight and Sunday, that disease called sin. Everybody call it sin. Not a mistake. It's not just a mistake. It's sin. And it's a disease that has infected all of humanity. Everything. Even the animal world. The plant world. As a result, everything dies. Because sin infected it. Where did that come from? It came from Adam's disobedience. So that's the reason when a person cannot really relate to God until he's born again. That's what Jesus taught Nicodemus. Right? you got to be born of the water and of the Spirit. That's what I mean by being born again. When you're born, you're born the first time of the pericardial sac. or It's not called pericardial sac. That's around your heart. What is the, the womb, the sac around the womb? The, the embryonic sac. That's what I said. <laughs> that otic sac that that baby's in, whenever a, a woman gives birth, what happens? Her water breaks. You've got to be born of the water. But it's not enough to have natural birth. Come on, somebody. you also got to be born of the Spirit. You've got to be born again. Now, when a person becomes born again, their spirit man is awakened unto God. Okay? The problem is the body's not awakened unto God. The body is still relating with this fallen world. And then on top of that, you've got your soul. And your soul is self-conscious. And your soul is, is your self-awareness. It is the seat of your intellect, your mind, your will, your emotions. And your soul is corrupted because your soul is infected with all the philosophies and ideologies of this world's system. So watch now. One-third of you is wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. But two-thirds of you is wall-to-wall -wall world system, fallen nature, working in tandem with one another. And the Bible says, if any two agree, it shall be done. All right? So that's the reason when you got saved, you did what I did. 
You, you, you failed God the first few days that you got away from the altar and you felt like, what's wrong with me? Why? I thought I got saved. Why did I want to do that? Why did I want to go back and do that again? Well, it's because the inside of you, the new man, has been made right with God. But the outer man and your soul that is the seat of your intellect, your will and your emotions has not yet been glorified or purified. So that's the reason we have to, and we'll talk about this in another message, renew our mind and crucify our flesh. Renew our minds and crucify our flesh. Now Proverbs chapter 4 verse number 23 tells you to keep your heart with all diligence for out of them spring the issues of life. The word heart there is the Hebrew word for the soul. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says all of your issues come out of your soulish rim. All of your issues come out of your soulish rim. Now, I made this statement. I want to reiterate it tonight. And I'm going to shout it so that people on the back row of every church in, a, in the world will hear it. And that is this. Immature Christians don't like this teaching about needing to crucify your flesh and renew your mind because it takes away all the excuses. As long as you can blame all of your failures and your faults and your mess-ups on a demon being the source of the issue, you don't have to take responsibility for your behavior. So look at me. Do you know why all of a sudden there's this upswing in this thing called the deliverance movement? And I'm not against it. I believe in deliverance. But do you know why there's this upswing in this thing called a deliverance movement and there's no more teaching on holiness? I'll tell you why. Because if your problem is a demon, then your problem's not you. But I want, I've come to tell you tonight, you don't need a demon to destroy yourself. You'll do that all by yourself. You don't need a demon to do that. And by the way, the devil has already been defeated. 2,000 years ago at the cross, Jesus spoiled principalities, powers, made a show of them openly. That devil and every demon that is under his influence is already defeated. And when you got born again, you were seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, far above all principalities, powers, might, dominion, and every name that is named. Which means you're already victorious and that devil's already defeated. So don't tell me a Christian can have a devil. You might be demonized. Which means you've allowed a demon to influence your life. But if that demon has come into your life, it's not because you're demon possessed. It's because you opened a door for it. And you invited through disobedience. We're going to talk about obedience again. Because she did such a, Jennifer Wills did an amazing job on that. Y'all didn't realize what she was teaching that night. But I, the Holy Ghost was talking to you. Obedience shuts the door to the adversary. Disobedience opens the door to the adversary. Look at me, child of God. You don't even have to have me to pray for you. You can be free tonight, sitting right in your seat, by making a decision to do life God's way, to do life the Word's way, and not fall victim to the desires of your flesh and your corrupted thinking. And you can live in victory simply by making a decision to let the inner man run your life instead of letting the outer man and the soulish man run your life because all of your issues, everybody say, all my issues. Everybody touch your neighbor and say, and you got a bunch. Right? All my issues flow out of my soul. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible is right and everybody else is wrong. All my issues flow out of my soul. I told you, it's kind of like a boat. Boats are built to thrive in the water. Boats are built to handle storms. They are. Most boats, 
especially big boats, are built to handle storms. And did you know what? They can go through just about anything, no matter how bad the storm is, as long as the water don't get in the boat. But as soon as the water gets in the boat, it sinks the ship, even though the boat was created to survive the storm. And most of us, the issues of our life, the problems of our life, the broken relationships in our life, all of these troubles that we have is because we have allowed some corrupted water from the storm in our life to get in our boat instead of keeping it out. And everybody in this room is like one or two people when it comes to storms. You're either like Jesus who can be in the boat and cause peace to come to the storm or you'll be like Jonah and you'll be the source of the storm because you're a storm carrier. And there's a lot of people that are storm carriers. That's the reason, listen, they can move from one place to the other and the same issues chase them everywhere they go. They say, well, it's just a family curse. No, it's not a family curse. It is, I can break a family curse right now. Just with obedience. Come on. The devil doesn't have that much power over me. Well, it's in my bloodline. I understand what we're teaching. Because of how I was raised, because of my environment, we, you know, we've got to believe instead of the Bible, Pavlov's dog. Right, you know, Pavlov's dog, we, we tie you to a rope and you go in a circle and, you can't, and your environment affects it. Yes, I believe my environment affects me. It affects the way I think. And the way I think determines the decision I make, the members of my body. And the decision I make either brings a blessing or a curse on me. That's the real truth. But you can break every curse. Man, I don't know why I'm on this right now. Who is this for? You can break every curse off your family, off your life by simply obeying what the Word of God says to do. And guess what? You don't have to have me throw oil on you. And we don't have to have get buckets for you to spit up in. Even though I believe all that happens. I do believe all that happens. But not everybody Jesus run into did he try to cast the devil out of. Most of the people he ran into. He said go and sin no more. In other words, don't open the door for it again. And while I'm on it, I'm going to preach. The man of Gadara, who was demon-possessed with at least five to 6,000 demons, depending on what you think a Roman group is, five to 6,000 demons in the one man, Gadara, in the tombs, cutting himself, violent to everybody around him. When Jesus cast the devils out of him, he wanted to get in the boat and go with Jesus, and Jesus said no. You go back to this demon-infested community that you came out of. Just go and sin no more. Isn't that amazing? One encounter with Jesus, I can walk free if I just don't open the door for the same demons that left my life. That's the reason Jesus warned, when you do have a demon leave your life, you better make sure that you fill that house because he's going and getting seven more wicked than himself and he's going to bring them back and he's going to see if he can inhabit the house. And worse will be the latter part of that house than it was the first part of that house. Guys, listen, I believe... Okay, everybody, everybody touch your neighbor and say, he believes in deliverance. He believes in demons, Okay. You've heard me teach on it. I believe in it. But I, we have gotten an unhealthy move going on right now in the body of Christ. Everybody is running around chasing a devil. When really what they should be chasing is disobedience. And cutting it off. And almost every person I've ever ministered to in my entire life, the issue was not a demon. It was disobedience. Everybody okay? All right. So with all that said, let's read Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to teach for about another 15 minutes. 
and then we'll come back Sunday. Romans chapter 7, Paul, again, this is the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, caught up into the third heaven, greatest missionary in early church history, had more revelations about the coming of the Lord and the Gentiles and other things. Paul's a spiritual man. You would be hard-pressed to say that Paul's not spiritual. Paul's a spiritual man. What? Listen to how he talks about his walk with God, his journey with God. When I read this, it gives me comfort. Because I know I'm not crazy. Because he sounds crazy. Come on, he sounds crazy. I sound sane compared to what Paul writes here. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. For I know that is, that is in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I don't find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin. I swear this brother sounds this schizophrenic. I, it's sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that, is, that, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. Now, if you're taking notes in your Bible, please underline that part of verse 23. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity. There is the recipe for bondage. Right there. That's the recipe for bondage. To the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. When you read that, it is obvious that this dude, like me, has a war within And this right here ought to make all of you feel better. Everybody in this room who feels like, I love Jesus, but sometimes I blow it so bad, and I don't know why I blow it bad, because that's not what I really wanted to do. I don't even know why I did it. Seemed like the right thing to do at the moment, but I knew better. It's almost like there's a devil in me trying to get me to do this, but I know God's in me. Come on, anybody else felt that way? Okay, the rest of y'all are lying in church. We all have felt that way. Well, all right. this is where this book right here, and specifically the book of Romans, becomes theologically important for everybody in this room. On May the 14th, 1738, a very discouraged missionary went very unwillingly to a religious meeting in London. When he was there in London at that church meeting, a miracle took place. And he wrote, About a quarter before nine, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt that I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. And he saved me from the law of sin and death. This is a man who had a war within. Would you like to know who the man who penned these words? He was the great missionary John Wesley, who was already on the mission field preaching the gospel. And he went to a church meeting, and for the first time, he says he really got born again. This is why it's dangerous to tell people just because they go to church, they're right with God. Because John Wesley was preaching the gospel and had not yet had a born-again experience. And in that church service that night, 
while a preacher was up there preaching, this man, John Wesley, finally, somehow or another, finds solace in God and realized that God had forgiven his sins and that he was truly born again. Would you like to know the sermon that was being preached that night? The message that he heard was the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on the whole book of Romans. Just a few months before this night, John Wesley had written in his journal these words, and I quote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? He came all the way across the ocean to preach the gospel to the Indians. And while he was here giving an altar call and Indians coming to his altar calls and giving their life to Jesus Christ, surrendering to the Lord, he was going back home at night and said, God, I know you're saving them, but who's going to save me? This is John Wesley. Just a few months before he heard this message, the preface of Dr. Martin Luther's commentary on the entire book of Romans. But that evening, at Aldridge Gate Street, his question was answered. And the result was something that led to the Wesleyan revival that swept across in England, all of England, and even transformed America. One man had a real born-again experience preaching the gospel, but going back to his room every night condemned that he didn't feel like he was saved. And when he finally got a hold of what the book of Romans was actually teaching, it revolutionized his life and revival hit the nation. I wonder if maybe one of the missing keys or elements that we're missing right now in the body of Christ is that we need to go back to some of these old doctrines that we have strayed away from and revive them once again and come back to them. Right? You don't need a demon if I can teach you the holiness of God and the holiness of the believer. Used to, we used to, how many of you guys grew up in a fire and brimstone church? When I grew up, every church was a, I didn't care if you were Baptist, Church of Christ, Methodist, Church of God, Pentecostal, Assemblies of God, every church. You, listen, they preached hell so hot you felt like your feet was dangling in it, Right? And as a result, they preached on holiness. Now, now, yes, there were some extremes. You know, you got to have your hair in a bun, right? All those ladies, bless their heart, they, they spent more money on bobby pins than they did on food for their children. Those buns would be, they looked like the Simpson, Marge Simpson, had buns up to here. They were in bondage, right? They were just in bondage. And some of those, some of those old services, the power of God would hit, and those ladies would get to, you know, they get to hooking and bucking like this, and those bobby pins would go pew, 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 pew. And some of us kids, literally, some of us kids were on the front row holding Bibles like this, like a shield. Bobby pins going, it's a miracle. I got eyes today. Bobby pins just. Going all over the building. And then their hair was so long because they wouldn't cut it because, you know, a woman's hair is her glory. Even though if they would have read the passage, the next verse says, We don't have this custom, neither do the churches of God. They didn't read that part, they left that part out. But they hung on to that that a woman needs, it's a sign of her holiness. And, and her hair would fall out of that bondage and it would get down here. And, and I'm telling you, she could use that thing like a whip. Wow, right? That's where all the rockers got it from. They got it from the holiness movement. I'm telling you. That was considered holy. Well, if you saw ankles, you were a harlot. I'm telling the truth, ain't it? It didn't matter if you was in the, am I, he was in the Baptist church. If you saw ankles, you was a harlot. And for a man, he had to wear white shirts. And he had to wear a, a, a blue suit, a charcoal suit, dark chocolate brown suit. He could get away with that in some circles. Some circles you couldn't. Or a black suit. 
and you couldn't wear a too bold a tie because if you wore too bold a tie, it meant you were arrogant and proud and you were trying to show off. I'm telling the truth. And men, men had white walls. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. That's where you go to the barber and instead of him just trimming the hair around your ears, he trims it up here like a, and, and, and your, your, your hair usually covers that so there's no sun on it. So it looked as white as a sheet of paper. You look like you had two big old 20s rolling down the interstate with just white walls on it. Right? But that's what made us holy. And our, and our hair couldn't touch our collar. Because man couldn't have long hair. Only women had long hair because that made us holy. Well, I understand that that was extreme. But now, skirts up to here. I think I'm going to start wearing, I think I'm going to start showing cleavage. And it ain't just women. It's men. And these people are Christians. What did we do? Well, we took the other pen, the pendulum and we swung it all the way back over here. Right? Not reading the Bible that says modesty is godliness. Right? And so now we swung it all over here. And as a result, guess what? We don't take the responsibility for picking out our clothes. We need a demon cast out of us. Because if we get the demon off of us, he'll make us start dressing right. No, if you read the Word of God and you look at what the Word of God says, you'll do what the Word of God says and you'll, you'll fix yourself right up. Holiness is not any outward characteristic. Listen to me. Holiness is proximity to the throne. That's your definition. There it is. Holiness is proximity to the throne. Because everything in the book of Revelation that gets close to the throne says holy. Holy, holy, holy. You get close enough to the Lord, I'll tell you what. When you walk out the door, the Holy Ghost will say, Mmm, might need to check that one. Come on. When you're mad at somebody, might need to check that. I told somebody, I'm going to just confess my sin because the Bible says healing will come. I was frustrated. This person popping off at me. I said to them, I said, hey, you know what Pentecostal means? I said, nope. I said, Pentecostal means I'll lay hands on you. I'll pray for you. We believe everything in the Bible as it said that God still does all that stuff. Like laying hands on you and praying for you. Amen. I said, but if you keep pushing me, I can flip a switch and I'll become a pimp and pimp slap you. Well, do you know the only thing that keeps the switch from flipping? Proximity to the throne. Because the closer I get to Jesus, when I walk out of my house and I get frustrated and I get ready to lay into somebody, guess what the Holy Ghost does? Hey, ooh, doggy. <laughs> Y'all, don't look at me so mad. Y'all got your little perfect hand. Little baby angel wings behind your back. Y'all look like you're floating on cloud playing hard. Come on, everybody in here knows that's not you. At least I didn't cuss him out or do something worse. But I had to ask the Lord to forgive me because I thought about it. Okay. Holiness is proximity to the throne. But we don't teach that anymore. So now we got demons running everywhere. Well, no wonder. When you are living in disobedience, you open the doorway for demon spirits. Everybody say, Pastor Shane preaching some good stuff right now. Paul's epistle to the Romans is still transforming people's lives tonight. Just the way it transformed Martin Luther and John Wesley. The one scripture above all the other scriptures that Martin Luther 
who had his own ex problems. That Martin Luther, that brought Martin Luther out of just mere religion into his joy of salvation was a scripture found in Romans 1.17. He was reading it one night and it transformed his life. Look at me. Martin Luther was a monk in the Catholic Church. And he was striving every day, doing penance, buffeting his body, trying to become holy. And what would happen is he'd go do penance and pray, spend all day and pray, and then he would sin with his mind or with some action. And he was wrestling within himself. He had this war going on with him. Oh, God, what's wrong with me? And then he'd go back next day and he'd do it again. And, and he thought, if I could just do enough of these religious works, eventually my inner man will change. One day, he took out the Bible, and he was reading it, and he came down to Romans chapter 1, and verse number 17 jumped off the page and hit him like a ton of bricks. Here it is. The just shall live by faith. Say that out loud with me, please. The just shall live by faith. Come on, say it again. The just shall live. Everybody, the just shall live. Well, that sounds good. We quote it all the time. But we don't know how to do that. How does that play out in daily life? How do you live what's on the inside, on the outside? Well, this discovery, this revelation by Martin Luther not only challenged and transformed his life, but guess what it did? It shook the entire church world and it led to the biggest church split in all of Christian history. Look at me. And religion split two ways. Christianity. Catholicism and Protestantism. What is Catholicism? Catholic means universal. Protestantism is protest. So what's happening is Martin Luther is buffeting himself and by religion he's trying to get right with God on the outside. This is what we do. He's just going to do enough good deeds, say enough prayers. He'll be right with God on the outside. And one day he reads Romans 1.17 and he realized, hold it. I can't make myself right with God. Nobody can make me right with God. The only way I can be right with God is, through, is in a relationship with God through the person or the man, Jesus Christ, who is the great mediator of this covenant. And his atoning death, burial, and resurrection, that's the only way I can be right with God. And all of a sudden, like John Wesley, it hit him. Now I'm right. I'm justified. Nothing has changed on the outside yet. But he realizes on the inside, I'm just as if I never sinned before Jesus. My spirit man, that is God conscious. So you know what he does? He protests against clergy corruption and the church's view of indulgences that took the focus off of the repentance of sin. What was happening is the clergy had little sheets of paper and these papers were called indulgences. And if you wanted to go out and get plastered at a party and sleep with everybody at the party, you could do that. All you had to do was give the right offering and you could buy an indulgence. And then you could go and indulge yourself. In other words, the clergy was remitting your sin before you ever even did it. And Martin Luther said, hold it. Something is wrong with this. And he started protesting it. And so what he does is he, he writes something called the, the 95 Thesis and he nails it to the door of the church and it's 95 arguments against all of this corruption and these indulgences. 
And how man's not saved by works, he's saved by grace. But if a man's really saved by grace through faith, he won't go out there and live like that. And this is corruption. What we're doing is we're giving people a license to come to church and just live like they want to live. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. We just give them an indulgent. But you know what? As long as they come to church and they sit in our pews and our seats and they give them the offering plate and every now and again throw a hand up at their favorite song, then they're still part of the church and they go out and live like hell. And Martin Luther said, no, 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 no. i got to protest this. We would do well to revisit this. Because somebody needs to protest this mess that we got going on called Christianity in the Protestant movement. We're Protestants without a protest. Luther found this wonderful verse, the just shall live by faith. And he came up with this doctrine called justification by faith alone. And I don't have a lot of time to go into this tonight, but let me just give you a real easy mathematical equation to sum up this doctrine. Here it is. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus anything else equals nothing a man is not a woman is not saved by his works you are not right because of what you did you're only right because of what Jesus did my best day in the Lord if I walked as perfect as I could walk and I think I've committed no sin the Bible calls my righteousness my righteousness filthy rags in the sight of God and what we've done in the body of Christ is we've added all of this junk to what it means to really be born again and as a result we don't know who we are in Jesus so we don't know how to live so you know if I can take religion you know if an offering will make me right or praying will uh, two hours a day will make me right or if I attend enough church services and that makes me right then I can do that and still go out and live like hell But Jesus plus anything is nothing. And I could add this. I didn't put this up there. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow. Listen, you can't make yourself right. I can't make myself right. And why am I preaching this? Because if you don't settle this part, you'll be like Luther, you'll be like John Wesley, and you'll even be like I used to be. You'll be fighting all the time thinking you're never right with God. You're never right with God. Never right with God. And the reason for that is because you're taking Jesus and trying to add all of this stuff to it, hoping that it's going to make you closer to God. The only thing that makes you close to God is Jesus and when that great high priest that's the reason I love Hebrews with Romans when that great high priest entered into the heavens and took his holy blood and offered it on the mercy seat of God in that heavenly temple not only did the gates and the doors fling wide open in the earthly temple as the veil was rent from top to bottom the heavenly doors swing wide open to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved I don't have to go through a religious calisthenic I don't have to play any games all I gotta do is sincerely call upon the name of the Lord and I shall be saved and then when I am truly born again I can find peace in God and that is the beginning of peace everywhere else and you'll never have it till you get secure in your faith. 
So in the Southern Baptist circles, in the ba some Baptist circles, Southern Baptist circles in particular, they teach the doctrine of unconditional divine security, which I don't believe in, and I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't believe I'm divinely secure. I believe my security is a lot more secure than most spirit-filled Pentecostal people. But that's not why I don't believe it. It's because doctrines are built upon each other, like a house is built upon a foundation. And you can't believe in unconditional divine security until you believe in unconditional divine election. Calvin made that doctrine first, and he said, you got to believe in this, and then as a result, you're unconditionally divinely secure. Unconditional divine election means God chooses who he wants to be saved and who he doesn't want to be saved, and nobody has a choice in the matter. So therefore, if God chooses Kevin to be saved, and he chooses her to be Romans chapter 9, the trash can, then that means she's going to hell whether she has a choice or not, whether she thinks she is or not. And he's going to heaven because he is divinely elected by God. And since he's divinely elected by God, he can't lose his salvation because he never chose himself. See how the doctrines build on one another? However, we might do good as, bad, or as Pentecostal spirit-filled folks to go study a little bit of divine security and understand how secure we are in Jesus. Let me tell you how secure you are. The Bible says if the Lord puts you in his hands, the devil can't pluck you out. Now, the devil can't pluck you out. You can apostate. You can walk out. But you'll have to fight the Word of God. You'll have to fight the conviction of the Holy Ghost. You'll have to fight the, the unification power of the body of Christ holding you accountable. It's not easy to walk away from God and go reprobate. Anybody in this room who's living right right now and, and had ever backslid, used to live right and you backslid, you know how miserable you were. I've heard so many stories. Well, I backslid and I was at a bar. I'm about three sheets into the wind. You should have heard me. Preacher, I was preaching to everybody. Jesus is coming soon. We get, we get high. And every time we get high, all we talked about was the rapture. Well, what is it? I'll tell you what it is. There was something on your inside that would not let you go. So even in the pig's pen... After a little while, the father's still waiting, but the prodigal can come to himself and say, I'm better in father's house than I am anywhere else. I'm going to go be a slave there. Yeah. Woo, hallelujah. I'm about to preach myself happy. I'm glad I'm secure in Jesus. I'm glad I don't have to worry about. Because the truth is, there's none righteous, no, not one. So if we're basing this whole thing on our perfection, then we're all in trouble. Can we just take a moment and shout right here, please? Hallelujah! Come on, somebody give the Lord a hallelujah. Somebody give him a glory. Somebody give him a praise the Lord. Aren't you glad this thing don't depend on you? I'm done. Now when I get that settled, inside. It doesn't mean I have arrived. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. Martin Luther clung so hard to justification by faith, he abandoned works altogether. And everybody who even believed in works was of the devil. And the primary target was the Jews because they held to the law. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, you're not made right by the law. And he copped an attitude about it. And he wrote a book. You ought to go read it. It's called The Treaty on the Jews. 
And to show you how demonic the book is, Hitler grabbed it, dedicated the Holocaust on Martin, on, on, to Martin Luther by starting the Holocaust on his birthday, and he used Martin Luther's book as a playbook for the destruction of the Jewish people. Go read it. This is why you got to know history, folks. So just because you get right in one area doesn't mean you can't stop. You need to stop striving in other areas. He went too far with it. Like all of us good Christians do. We get some. oh, this is it. I'm reading the Bible. Well, I saw the Lord worshipped on the Sabbath day. Well, this is it. Everybody else who don't worship on Sabbath day, they're all going to hell. If you just read a little father, Paul said, none of these holy days is... You just got to read a little further. The entire early church went to Sabbath and met on the first day of the week. What do you do with that? And then when the Jerusalem council got together and decided, hey, these Gentiles are coming into the faith, what do they need to do to be right with God? They need to be circumcised. Do they need to follow all these holy days? Go read it in the book of Acts. They said, no. They just need to abstain from sexual immorality. They don't need to eat meat that's been strangled. They don't need to partake of blood and keep themselves unspotted from the world. They didn't put any of that legalism on them. By the way, those 12 men were all Jewish. Isn't it amazing in Christianity we grab something and we just we camp out there and bless God everybody else is going to hell that don't believe. I don't know how I got off of it. I'm just trying to tell you, it's not the it's not it's not gonna solve all your problems in your spiritual walk when you get saved. It's the beginning. The born again experience is the beginning. And you build off of that. But you can't build off of it. If you don't know who he is in you and who you are in him and that this has nothing to do with you. You're kind of like Abraham. You old, dried up prune you. So you know what Abraham, God does when he cuts covenant with Abraham? You know what he does? He takes Abraham and he puts him to sleep. And then God comes down and he takes a lamb and he cuts the lamb in half and he pours the blood on the ground and he sets one half of the lamb over here and one half over there. And then the Bible says like a smoking furnace and a burning pot, God walks a figure eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings in the blood. And you know how much Abraham had to do with this? Nothing. He was asleep. And you know how much you really have to do with how saved you are? Nothing. Because even when you were dead in trespasses and sins, Christ <laughs> woo, died for you. He let this old sinful world put you to sleep to where you didn't have nothing to do. Do you know why he needs you out of the way? Because when he could swear by none greater, he swore by himself. He didn't place his hand on a Bible. He placed his hand on himself. And here's what he said. If this covenant ever gets broken, I'll break it. Because I'm the one who made it. And since I'm an eternal God, 
and I never go back on my promises. I'm the Lord and I do not change. In me there's neither variableness nor shadow of turning. I make this covenant and I put you to sleep to let you know this ain't got nothing to do with you. So if by my love and in my love I reach down with my spirit Sorry, this is what happens when I spend a lot of time with him. If God is ever so gracious, to reach down in his mercy and put his hand on your heart and you hear him whisper these words come to me you never need to reject him Even if you've been born again and you're truly born again and God in his mercy, even when you're doing something you know you shouldn't do. Don't turn me up too much, guys. If God in his mercy while you're in the middle of that sin should have reached down in his mercy and grab your heart conviction fill your soul and you hear these words get out of this it is a dangerous thing to harden your heart like Pharaoh I want you to have peace in God because you can't have the peace of God until you get peace with God and we're running around trying to get the peace of God because we're going we're gonna to get a peace of God we're going to get a peace of God sometimes I, I tell Adam all to some, and I understand what they're singing so I'm not damning it I'm just telling you sometimes we sing songs I think that's a dumb song Holy Spirit come down I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying on the end oh, what are you talking about I'm already down <laughs> y'all ever feel that way I, but I understand what we're saying we want his presence to manifest I get it so let's don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I just every song is about you and me and very few songs are just I love you Lord and I lift my voice to worship you Oh, my soul, rejoice. Come on, sing it with me. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. And let it be a sweet, sweet sound 
apologize for my singing. I'm not the best singer anymore. But I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord. I exalt I exalt Thee, I exalt Thee, O Lord, for Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth, and Thou art exalted far above all gods. For Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all Every voice now, I exalt thee. I Father, I love you. Give us peace with you. Give us peace in our soul. Help us to find that place of rest where we cease from our labor and we rest in your finished work of our life. Show us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I hope the word touched you tonight. We'll see what he has to say Sunday, Lord willing. Until then, get out of here. Go do something big for him this week. I'll see you Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, 4 p.m. One of these days we're going to say Sunday morning and mean it anyway. <laughs>